Hello, my name is Matthew uh, Gaston, and today I'll be talking about microgreens, dorm room snacks to extraterrestrial sustenance. Um, this is being recorded in February 2021. I'm a PhD student at the University of Hawaii Manoa in the Department of Tropical Plant and Soil Sciences in the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. Um, like I said, my name is Matthew Gaston. Gonna close my face here. I'm a PhD student in tropical plant soil science. I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas. I enjoy plants a lot and I've had lots of plants growing up in this little greenhouse, but at this moment, not too many. You can see it's in shambles, but it's all right. Uh, then I did my undergraduate in California where I studied genetics and plant biology and science and math education. And now I'm in Hawaii where I look at street tree planting techniques, urban agriculture and microgreen production. So uh, in the great March, 2020, our university shut down and we had to do stuff from home, work from home. And so I played lots of Animal Crossing. Uh, that's my character there. But I also started growing my own microgreens at home. I started with daikon, which is a Japanese radish. It has a wasabi kind of mustard flavor to it. Grew it in this little pot in my window here. And uh, that's kind of what I got interested in uh, trying and more things in my home. So I'd been working with microgreens before this point, but then I had a reason to be growing them in, indoors because I was inside so frequently with the uh, lockdown. So today I'll be talking about two things. What are microgreens and uh, growing systems? So ways to grow microgreens. This is Earth. This is where we live. Uh, and this is the moon and Mars. And people would like to visit these two places uh, and live in these extremely dangerous environments. There's radiation that can cause cancer mutations, the lack of gravity affects our bones. Um, the, the, there's not any oxygen, so we have to supplement ourselves with that. And then also there's no magnetic fields to protect us. And, and uh, this can lead to increased um, radiation damage and uh, genetic material, DNA damage and cancer. And so when we voyage out to these places, we're going to need to be able to try and maintain our health the best we can. So we have a question. How do you preserve your health in such an unhealthy place? Perhaps we take vitamin or antioxidant supplements. So if we look at the data from Earth, we'll see that on Earth, there's no evidence uh, suggesting dietary antioxidant supplements promote human health or prevent disease or cancer, except in the slowing of age-related macular degeneration. So Lutein and zeaxanthin are two um, antioxidant or pro-vitamin compound supplements that have been shown to promote eye health, but nothing else necessarily. But there are observational studies, and we know this just um, is a word of mouth that you know eating vegetables and fruits confers positive health benefits. So when we need to maintain our health in space, we will need to efficiently produce nutrient rich foods in small spaces. So we need something that's high nutrient density. We need something that's compact and small, at least at the time of harvest. We need something that grows quickly and that's microgreens. Um, <laughs> microgreens are a, oh, exactly that. They're nutrient dense. They, got, they have more nutrients in them per unit volume than the mature version of the plant does. They're compact and small because we only grow them to a specific size and we cut them and eat them. They grow quickly and they're fresh and popular. Uh, studies on uh, people's preferences showed that people actually enjoy microgreens because of the great variety and diversity and the freshness to them. So number one, what are microgreens? They're nutrient dense, compact, small, rapid growth and popular, but that doesn't tell us a lot. So let's go into some details. A microgreen is any herbaceous plant grown in light and harvested as the first true leaves emerge. So let's look at an example, my precious daikon. It's like a radish. It's like a Japanese radish. Um, daikon has these two little leaves here. So these are called cotyledons and we have this little stem. And then that's where the first true leaf is coming out. So these are kind of like fake leaves or like baby leaves. And then the real leaves come out of here. The real leaves look different. And then once the real leaves grow out, then the plant doesn't taste good. And you got to wait until the root grows and you eat that. But you can eat this whole thing. 
um, bull's blood beet. So we have these two little leaves. These are called the cotyledons or like they're like the baby leaves. And then that's the first true leaf that's gonna grow out here. It's called the meristem. It's gonna grow out there. Uh, we would cut it at this stage and eat it. Same thing with arugula, but we generally let the first leaf grow a little bit more and then cilantro even. But in here, in this case, the leaf grows uh, more uh, significantly. So I'm just highlighting where the, the first true leaf is emerging. And it's different with each different species or cultivar of, of plant. So at the local market here in Hawaii, we have uh, this uh, green pea microgreen that is grown on the island, but for two ounces, they sell it for $11 at the local, local uh, organic produce store. So that's two ounces at down to earth, if you know what that is. Um, and then at the local Japanese market, Najiya, we have these sushi rolls, a tuna roll. And I always go after 7 p.m. So everything's 20% off. Um, they have these little daikon uh, radishes, but they call them sprouts. We'll talk about that in a second, but in their roll here. So it's like a wasabi flavor. They also put the wasabi packet and ginger and show you and stuff. Like that. Yes. Anyway, so they're used in a variety of ways, including even as salad. So this is like a radish salad with actual radishes and then microgreen radishes. And then we have this bougie bread with some microgreens on top and other things, presumably avocados and some cheese. Something. And then even as a garnish on this kind of soup, the tomato bisque soup or whatever this is, um, add some color and texture. And so those are my little radishes there. Uh, let's look at some of the anatomy. We don't need to see my face. Um, let's look at the morphology rather. So the, the structure of the microgreen. So the junction between this root and the shoot is called the crown. So this distinct junction where the soil would be or the, uh, the difference between root and shoot is called the crown. Then we have the cotyledons. So these are the first leaf-like structures that come out. We could call them embryonic leaves. We could call them baby leaves, but they're properly called cotyledons. Um, this is called the shoot apical meristem. This is where the first true leaves emerge out of here. This is where the plant will continue to grow. Then we have this stem here. So this piece of stem here below the cotyledons um, and above the crown is called the hypocotyl. So hypo means below, caudal referring to cotyledons. So we have the hypocotyl here. With microgreens, we can cut the plant at any point along the hypocotyl. And you can just eat that whole thing. Most of the flavor is concentrated in the cotyledons. So this particular plant is the daikon radish or the daikon microgreen. And it tastes kind of spicy, kind of like a mustardy flavor. And so most of the flavor is concentrated in the cotyledons. Lastly, we have roots down here. We can see some of the soil is still there. Um, there's a scale on the side. So what plants can be microgreens? Well, uh, essentially most garden herbs, vegetables, and flowers can be microgreens, except for solanaceous crops. And we'll talk about it in a second. But there's our daikon bull's blood beet, my personal favorite, the red rambo radish. It tastes like the daikon, but it's less spicy has some nice color due to anthocyanins, um, which are considered an antioxidant. Um, and I like the diversity in this one. Oh yes, my favorite, beloved. So we can see this is the seed coat um, and then all these cotyledons here growing. Oh, beautiful. So what plants cannot be microgreens? Well, solanaceous crops, which is to say plants in the family solanaceae, which is basically saying nightshades, which is basically saying tomatoes, eggplants, potatoes, and peppers. You don't want to eat those as microgreens because they have toxic compounds in them. So those are some little uh, tomato plants that are maybe two, three weeks old. Um, they're not really microgreens at this point, but you don't want to eat them at this stage because they're, they contain uh, toxins. Nightshades tend to be uh, dangerous to some extent. So what plants can be microgreens? A good variety, including three categories that we would say herbs, vegetables, and flowers. These are not, you know, strict scientific categories, but these are culinary kind of horticultural terms. So in terms of herbs, dill is a, a nice herb that is a microgreen, basil, sorrel, and anise hyssop. Uh, vegetables would be the things we think about as broccoli, uh, mizuna, scallion, and alfalfa. And then flowers are interesting uh, because they have a different kind of floral, fresh kind of light flavor. And they often have a nice color to them as microgreens. So we have Colossia, the marigold, 
are borage and amaranth. And so of these categories, um, some of the plants are edible at all life stages, like broccoli, this is edible at all life stages. Um, with marigold and borage, you can only eat the plant when it's a microgreen, as it starts getting uh, more, once it grows and develops more vegetative tissue, it will become hard and bitter and it won't be edible. You could probably eat the flowers, but same thing with borage. Uh, once it's past this stage, it's not gonna be really tasty. Even with daikon, uh, you have to eat it at a specific time, but broccoli is an example of a plant you could eat at any life stage. So let's look at that. So broccoli is interesting because we have microgreens here, which is you grow the plant for seven to 14 days and then you harvest it and eat it. And this is uh, what we're talking about today. But also you could grow it for one to seven days and be called a sprout, or you could let it grow a little bit further and call it a baby green. Typically we encounter broccoli as the head or the crown, which is basically a bunch of flowers. So if you let them, if you let it mature longer, it'll open up the flowers and you can eat all of these things. Um, so, you know, some plants have an advantage of being able to be eaten at all stages of their, of their life. And some are only eaten as microgreens like borage, but plants do not grow at the same rate as, as you might know from uh, observation. So let's take a look at the microgreen time to harvest in days. So on the top uh, X axis, we have time in days, and then we will have different cultivars or types species of microgreens on the Y axis. So my beloved daikon is uh, here. So you can harvest it anywhere between seven and 15 to 16 days. Uh, I've experienced that if you wait about 10, that's like ideal in terms of flavor for my preferences. But, uh, you know, as you grow it, you'll notice differences uh, based on certain characteristics we'll talk about later revol revolving around media, uh, nutrients, light and water. But let's look at the beet. So bull's blood beet takes about twice as long with um, the uh, the best time to, to harvest it around 15 to 16, 17 days, but you could harvest it at any point in this cycle here and it would still be just as good. And now arugula is very similar to daikon in terms of its, its harvest time. And then cilantro and dill are much like the beet where they take a little bit longer to harvest until they're ready to be harvested. Uh, but then anise hyssop takes significantly longer being ready you know, on average around 27, 28 days, but as a nice window here. And so what we can do is we can then group these different uh, microgreens into like the fast growing mix. And then uh, these are here. So basil, broccoli, sorrel, mizuna, celosia, and borage grow pretty quickly relative to our slow growing mix, like dill, cilantro, scallion, alfalfa. So if it grows slower, it'll tend to be a higher value crop. Um, additionally, we can make mixes of seeds and, and grow them together. So microgreen mixes, diversity is the spice of life. There's a website called Johnny's Seeds, I'll talk about in a second, but they sell these microgreen mixes. And to have a good mix, we need to have a common harvest date. So they all are ready to be harvested at the same time. They have complementary flavors and a complementary appearance or aesthetic. Um, this is more for market and retail and, and consumer, uh, like if you're at a a fancy restaurant or something and you know you want it to look good so this particular mix contains mizuna cabbage kale and kohlrabi all of which um tend to be ready to be harvested at the same time we have other mixes as this one's a bunch of different types of radishes so we call them cultivars cultivated varieties of radishes uh, we can see that some have a deep purple that's the red uh, radish red rambo radish and we have these reddish stems that's a different one um, this one is beets and chard. So, you know, it's a different mix of different types or cultivated varieties of beets and chard. So they have some nice color to it and different nutrients as well. But so this is a, a Pokemon called Victory Bell. It's a good one. It's it's based on a plant called Nepenthes or pitcher plant. And it has specific statistics. So it's really strong in attack and special attack. Um, this is very similar to microgreens. Microgreens have different stats, um, just like Pokemon. So a little broccoli here has a pretty high growth rate, but pretty low like anthocyanin. So this is the compound that makes you kind of reddish or pink. 
or a reddish or purple, sorry. Um, and it has high phenolics and chlorophyll content. Uh, and so each microgreen is gonna have its own stats. So this is an example. The, so on our x-axis, we have different microgreens represented by these letters. Doesn't necessarily matter what the letters are in this example, but the point of this is to illustrate that there is a significant difference in the content of different nutrients. This is uh, looking at phenolics. So certain antioxidant contents. So this particular um, microgreen here has a significant, statistically significant uh, amount of phenolics or antioxidants present. When we look at these graphs, the letters on top represent like uh, similarities. So if it, is, if it says A, then it means like, oh, well, everything in group A is like similar and everything in group B is similar. Uh, everything in group C is similar in terms of statistics. So there's no difference um, in the phenolic antioxidant compa uh, concentration between this one and this one and this one. And then there's group D. So what we see by saying A, B, C, D is that A is sig significantly different than B. We have these little error bars to show us that as well. Um, and, and same thing with anthocyanin. So this is the, the pigment molecule that gives it kind of a reddish purplish hue. So this particular one that's called BN is has a very high concentration while others have low concentrations. And so we can map this um, in a in a circle kind of diagram here. It's not really a circle because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I guess it's a decagon in this decagon. So each of these different colors and shapes represents a different type of microgreen, which are listed over here if you were interested in looking at that. Um, and the citations at the bottom if you're interested um, in that particular thing. But what the point of this is to say that this one that has the red square has a high anthocyanin content, um, but it's pretty low in dietary fiber. It's pretty low in carotenoids. So this would be like vitamin A, kind of pro-vitamin pro A, but it's high in anthocyanin, which is like an antioxidant and anti-radical activity, which is the um, antioxidant uh, activity. It's pretty high. So it's low over here in fiber, but luckily we have green square here that's high in fiber, but green square is low in total anthocyanin. So if we have a variety of microgreens, then we can increase the nutrient diversity. So fiber is good for us and all these different um, things that they have listed here are nutrients that are beneficial for human consumption. So different nutrient profiles for different microgreens. So if I just ate exclusively you know, one of these, I might be missing out on some things. Um, Johnny Seeds is my beloved company. This is not sponsored by Johnny Seeds. Um, let me make a, a pitch here. Hello, uh, are you looking for a, a high quality microgreen mix or microgreen seeds? Why not try new Johnny Seeds today? All right, that's my uh, ad advertisement. But yeah, okay, so they're, they're sold out right now because this is being recorded in the middle of the pandemic and um, this particular mix they don't have right now. But this is a, a microgreen mix and you can buy them and you can see the cost here and stuff. Um, growing systems, so it's time to talk about growing them. All right, so when we grow plants, specifically microgreens, I started in this little uh, cup here and then I transitioned into a 10 inch by 10 inch uh, tray with no holes in the bottom. And I put just some miracle grow uh, potting mix on a wine rack with a like plant grow light. And I got my red Rambo radishes growing here. And I, I sprayed them from the top so they would glisten and glow in the photo, but that's kind of a, a no, no. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So you could grow them like this. Um, and then eventually I upgraded to a rack with these plant grow lights. So I have my shoes over there and this is the door and this is kind of the hallway. I have my cacti and then my beets and my radishes. And I have one light and I slowly invested in more. Um, and so I have this black five shelf rack. I have the 10 by 10 bootstrap farms, no drain hole trays. I have this specific light. Um, it, you could use a variety of lights. We'll talk about it in a second, but I use free licked LEDs. So LEDs are energy efficient. And it's a full spectrum grow light. So it provides um, the appropriate light it needs for the plant. And then I use miracle Grow potting mix. So there's my rack, there's my lights. 
I have these. So each of these symbols represents over 400 plants. Um, and then I can fit, what is this? 16, I can fit 20 trays. I, I've given this presentation so many times and I count every time, it's 20. I can fit 20, there we go. I even wrote it down, I forgot. Okay, I can fit 20 trays per rack um, and then over 400 little microgreen plants per tray. So I can grow a lot of these plants uh, in this tray. Now, uh, mine was quite cheap because I built it from things I had found independently, but if you had uh, lots of funding, you could buy a specific system designed for growing plants indoors. This one is quite expensive at $800, but it's it's pretty much the same thing I've I've shown you with uh, things I bought off Amazon. So growing systems, there's a couple requirements. You need a medium or like a, something for the roots to grow into or anchor into. We need some nutrients, we need water, and we need light. So this is the basics of, of growing plants, essentially. Let's talk about media. So media refers to the thing that the plants grow into. Oh, so we can grow it in potting mix like I did in the, the example. A thing called cocoa core, which is the husk of a coconut that has been ground up and then pressed into a block or a brick. And you take this brick and you soak it in water and it expands and you use this as a media to grow in. There's a thing called hemp mat, which takes hemp fibers and they, they weave it into a kind of a felt kind of mat. We have a biostrate felt, which is similar to the hemp mat, but it's a little bit different. Um, it's pH balanced, it's biodegradable, and uh, this is my preference. We'll talk about that shortly. And then we have rock wool, which is a, it's, it's, it's a type of insulation that people have used to grow plants. The roots can anchor into it, and it's made of, 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 of like rock. <laughs> it's like spun rock. So my favorite is BioStrait Felt. There's two thicknesses, 185 grams per meter squared. And then the thicker one, which is 300 grams per meter squared. So this is how they, the, you know, they determine the, the thickness of it by saying um, weight per unit area. It's designed for hydroponics. So it, it's, it's, it's perfect for, you know, growing microgreens. Um, it's pH balanced, it's biodegradable, it's lightweight. Uh, it's pretty easy to use. So in terms of reusability, which of the following are reusable? Well, um, Potting mix and coca core are reusable, but the other three, biostrate felt, hemp mat, and rock wool, once you use it once, you cannot reuse it because the roots are inside of that felt or, or wool or fabric, and uh, you have to throw it out. So with coca core and potting mix, miracle Grow potting mix, once you use it once, uh, you will be able to reuse it. You just pull out the roots, and then you can sterilize it with hot water, and then you're good to go. Now, which one's the least messy or which ones are not that messy at all? The hemp mat in the felt and rock, well, rock wool is pretty messy. So just these two, the hemp mat and the felt, you roll it out, you cut it and you lay it down um, in, your, in your tray and that's it, easy. Biodegradable. So we have the hemp mat that's biodegradable, bio straight felt, potting mix, and then cocoa core. Rock wool is, is like, um, it's like puffy rocks. So that is not biodegradable. But then the interesting thing is, which one do we have to add nutrients to? So that's all of them except the potting mix. Biostrate felt, rock wool, the hemp mat, and cocoa core do not have any nutrients in them. Cocoa core, while it looks like dirt, and um, it's just the husk of a tropical fruit, and there's no nutrients in it. Um, so you have to supplement it with nutrients. When we talk about nutrients, we want to make sure that we have a couple of things. So on the right, we have these pictures of bags designed for hydroponics or designed to supplement um, media that doesn't have any nutrients in it. So when we have these numbers, it says, this one says 10, 5, 14. This one says 8, 15, 36. This is the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus to potassium that we call NPK. So this is the NPK ratio. This particular one by Master Blend is designed for lettuce. So if I were growing like a lettuce hydroponically or, or some kind of um, microgreen that's closely related to lettuce, then I would maybe select this one because of the specific ratio for the specific needs of lettuce. 
Now, this one is a general mix from General Hydroponics called Maxi Grow. It's uh, 10, 5, 14. The ratio is important, but uh, with microgreens, the thing is that they're only going to be growing for 7 to 14 days, maybe 14, 20 days, depending on which type you're growing. And at a, that point, you just need to make sure that there's nutrients in the solution so that they can grow. And so you would take these bags, it's like salt, and you would mix it with the water at an appropriate ratio that's described on the bag. So that's the NPK. We also have a thing called calcium nitrate that the plants need, and then also the magnesium sulfate. But the biggest one, the most important one is the NPK. Honestly, I think you could get away with not growing the plants with these two because you're gonna harvest them quickly, but um, you know, just my thoughts on that. In terms of water, so the pH of water that you're growing your hydroponics or you're growing your microgreens in should be 5.5 to 6.5. And then you can water them from the bottom. So what happens is I had watered my microgreens from the top. And if you water the plants the microgreens from the top, then they're going to get the leaves wet. And when the leaves are wet, you have a high probability of spreading bacteria and fungi uh, on your leaf material, your cotyledons of your microgreens. And if you're spreading it around uh, it's going to damage your plant material and you're not going to be able to sell it because the, the primary value of the microgreen are the cotyledons. And if they're infected, then, then, then you can't sell it. So people like to water from the bottom because this is also an efficient method. So this one is called a drip. It's not really watering from the bottom. So the, the far left picture here is a, a pump is pumping and dripping water at the base of the plant. We don't really use it. To, we don't really use this with microgreens. The two that we tend to use the most are this one in the middle is called the wicking method. So there's water in a reservoir here, and this has our nutrients in it. Um, the roots of the microgreen will grow and uh, be, there'll, there'll be a, like a paper wick or felt wick or something into the main uh, area where the plant is. And then the roots will grow in here, but they could also grow down. And then lastly, this is the one I use is, um, you're basically just saturating it in the nutrient solution. And so I grow my microgreens now on the felt biostrate, which would sit in a 10 by 10 tray. And then I have my nutrient solution that is saturated the felt, and then the roots kind of sit in that and grow. Um, yeah, light. So in terms of light, certain colors of light are better for plant growth. So if we look at this graph here, we have wavelength on the x-axis. So wavelength correlates to a color that we can see here. So blue is in this wavelength around 430. And then we all have red over around 720 and so forth. And so each of the wavelengths corresponds to a color that we see with our eyes. And then over here on the y-axis is relative sensitivity. So this is like um, how much of that color of light the plant can use and absorb for photosynthesis to grow and make sugar. And so we see that it's really low in the green and the yellow, it's kind of low, um, but it's very high in red and blue. So the two types of light that plants use the most of for photosynthesis and also for growing in specific growth and development processes are blue and red. And so if we had to grow plants uh, with only two colors, we would grow with blue and red. And this is an industrial setting. Um, microgreens are growing in here. So they have these blue and red LED or light emitting diodes. And to us, it looks purple because the two colors are kind of um, blending, but um, they're trying to grow uh, with low energy loss. So as efficiently as possible by using the two frequencies of light that are most um, uh, absorbed by the plant. I personally like to use white light. Oh, I like to use these white light because when I look at the plant, I want to be able to see it and it will look green and, and happy and beautiful as opposed to um, this where they kind of look gray or, you know, not my cup of tea. Uh, so yeah, this is the one I use. It has these white LEDs and blue and red LEDs. So it can still um, provide a full spectrum, it's a kind of yellowish, frankly, but then also the blue and red um, frequencies in there as well. So the way you can install it uh, with the rack, I kind of took these little cords and kind of looped it and hung it around, but you can install them permanently. 
So with light, um, there's a thing called the inverse square law. And so this means that the intensity of the light changes uh, proportionally with distance. So if we start here, the intensity is at one. So we have intensity from zero to one, and then we have distances in, in units R. So as I start you know, at unit R away from a light, then I'll be at 100, and then I move uh, two R distances away, then it drops. Um, it decays exponentially. And so now I'm only getting one fourth of the light and so forth all the way. And so you, we see that as you get three uh, units a distance away, you only have uh, such a small amount here. This is a good example here. So this is our light source. And so at one distance R, we have uh, this A on this rectangle here and it has like nine, I think, yeah, these are nine beams shooting into it. But then we go another distance R, so we're at two R. Now there's only three. So we started with nine uh, beams shooting out, but then they get more diffuse. And then we have only three and we go another distance R and then we only have one. So when we look at our lighting, we want to take into account the distance because it's not a linear relationship. We call this exponential decay. So as you get farther away, you get exponentially less light on your plant, which means you're losing energy because you got to pay for the electricity of the light. But now the plant's not getting all of it. So that's the inverse square law. Yay. This occurs with gravity and other stuff. But. So to put it again, intensity exponentially decays as distance linear, linearly increases. So um, this is just an example of, you know, your plant canopies at a specific height. This one would be the most efficient on the far right because most of the photons or the light is going to be uh, hitting the plant. This would be very diffuse relative to this one. Growing systems. So uh, one of the final things I'll talk about here is that my favorite beloved Johnny Seeds, come, you know, this company out in Maine, they have done a trial on microgreens in 2017. What they did was they took a 10 by 20. So when we say 10 by 20 tray, that means 10 inch by 20 inch tray. So it's a rectangular tray. And they evaluated the different seeds that they have, the ones that they grow. So there's our bull's blood beet. And they provide recommendations as to how much of the seeds to use per tray, and then how much you should expect to get out of it. So this is uh, looking at planting density. So let's look at an example of bull's blood beet. So we see that they say the average number of seeds per tray in terms of grams is 23 grams of seeds per tray. Uh, the average or the approximate flats per ounce of seed is uh, corresponds to one. The average yield per tray is 7.5 ounces. And then they say the average maturity is 17 days. So they harvest it at 17 days. So at this company, Johnny Seeds to buy one ounce of bull's blood beet seeds is $6.75 at 7.5 ounces of beet microgreens. Um, that is the, the, the end product of growing it after 17 days. That would be uh, one ounce of seeds required to get 7.5 ounces of beet microgreens, which is a ratio of 7.5. So the, we would say that the yield to input ratio is 7.5. Generally, anything above seven is pretty solid. Anything above six even, but you know, I, I would say seven. Uh, one ounce of beet microgreens could retail for about $5 in this example. It depends on your market and where you are. Um, in Hawaii, it might be more expensive. It might be cheaper in other places. But so an example is maybe one flat that you sell um, or one flat of beet microgreens will be equivalent to about $38. So for each day that you're growing to beat microgreen, you'd be making $2.25. So that's an example of kind of how this would be useful uh, for someone trying to get into the industry growing, growing microgreens and selling it. There's lots of uh, resources out there. Not only can you, you uh, ask me questions via, you know, comment section or in person or however we know each other. Uh, you could go on Instagram, or this is Facebook, really. You go on Facebook and get a part of one of these groups. So this is a Facebook group called Microgreens for Beginners. This one is called Growing and Selling Microgreens Support Group. And I'm a member of this one. I don't feel like I'm a beginner, but everyone's still learning all the time. So I'm still learning. Um, 
and they have different posts and they can, you know, people will share what they're doing. Like, oh, I'm growing this broccoli. This is four days old. How does it look? So this would be a broccoli sprout. It's really dense. So there's probably a nutrient deficiency and I would probably cut these pretty soon. I didn't tell them that. Maybe I should have. Um, this individual here had a question said, hey, I'm, I'm trying to find the right lights to use. What should I use? Uh, this is, you know, if you want scientific articles, that's great. If you just want to know what people think, you could just ask people here. So they said, oh, get the strong uh, shop lights. Some people are like, oh, you got to get the special purple looking, you know, blue and red grow lights. Some people like the full spectrum white lights like me. These these tend to be brighter. And so they they can yield pretty well. And then, uh, you know, broccoli microgreen, someone set up their rack, they got the lights and they're showing it off. It's nice and stuff. All right. Well, uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, yeah, I, I enjoy microgreens. They taste delicious. Uh, thank you.